The Liberal government heads into this budget under pressure to rein in spending. Canada's deficit is projected to be $38.4 billion this year, and as long as there's a deficit, the debt will only get bigger. It's nearly doubled since 2015 to $1.2 trillion, costing the government tens of billions of dollars in interest alone every year. But Canadians are feeling the squeeze too. Interest rates are at a 23-year high, and yes, that's helped bring down overall inflation, but it's also sent the cost of rent and mortgages through the roof. Meanwhile, the economy is currently starved for growth. GDP barely grew in the fourth quarter of last year after a small contraction in the previous quarter. Goldie Hyder is the president and CEO of the Business Council of Canada, and he joins me now. Goldie, welcome back to the show. Great to be with you. Uh, when it comes to the federal government reigning in the spending of the budget, this has been a consistent call from you and your organization. What does that look like on April 16th to, to make you happy? Yeah, well, look, why ask me? Why, let's just look at what the government's, why, let's look at what the government said itself. What the government said itself in the last budget is, we are going to have this new guardrail. <laughs> they seem to have moving ones, but let's just say this is the one they're going to stick to. We're going to reduce current uh, costs, which are 1.4% of our GDP, down to 1% starting in the year 2026. Where is that 0.4 going to come from? Uh, it represents about roughly $12 billion a year over the course of the next four to five years. So the question of the government is, where are you going to find the 48 to $50 billion that's necessary to, to get you there? And the answer from them has been um, effectively one announcement by a Treasury Board minister saying, who wrote to their own colleagues to say, I need to find $15 billions in savings, right. which within 48 hours became repurposing. I mean, Canadians are smart enough to know the difference between savings and repurposing. And so we have a government here that just doesn't seem to understand that you can't spend willy-nilly. You have to have a plan. You have to execute it. And the flip side of that, David, is to grow the economy. Grow your revenues. Right. The, the repurposing, though, it wasn't one for one, right? It wasn't for every dollar that came out of one program. It went into another program. There was some savings uh, to, to, you know, Minuscule. I believe. But, uh, look, I, our, our view is just tell Canadians mm -hmm. where are you going to find this 0.4% this of GDP that you need to reduce between now and then. I think it's a legitimate question. They need to know because it's possible it's going to come at their expense. And this is why we're saying find growth enabling policies. Don't just spend all your time thinking about redistribution. I mean, the, the Prime Minister himself has said the economy is not about numbers. It's about people. Let me assure you, it's about numbers. <laughs> and those numbers affect people. And that's what we're trying to do is actually create the conditions for collaboration, partnership with the government of any political stripe. It doesn't matter to us. Let's find a way to grow our economy and not cut our way there either. But when you talk about growth, what's a growth enabling policy you want to see well, from Christian Freeland on the 16th? Because they've been pouring a lot of money into uh, green transition through the EV plant investments and through the tax credits to encourage investment yeah. along those lines. What, what are you looking yeah. for? They've been pouring a lot into their announcements. Uh, yeah. Of these policies. I think this government has, uh, first of all, the fiscal thing does matter, uh, David. You know, businesses do look at if a government's not serious about its fiscal framework, what it sees is taxes, not just taxes on corporations, but taxes on employees. So, as competitive as we are for capital, we're also competitive for talent. And so, people need to see a government that's serious about fiscal reform. But in addition to that, again, the thing I wrote to the Prime Minister about is his own announcements, their own policies on the permitting reform. If you create the conditions for capital to form in here, not latent with investments or sorry, incentives for foreign companies, but for Canadian companies, for domestic companies. There's debates about what our pension plans should do. You know what everybody should be focused on? Create the investment climate for capital to form here from anywhere in the world, but also from Canadian companies, which means you need predictable, stable permitting reform, something the government promised by December 31st of 2023, mm. still waiting. And then last one I would just note is the reaction from the government, um, which we celebrated and acknowledged as robust. The response to the, the so-called IRA in the U.S., setting aside whether we need it or didn't need it, Canada had to respond. The rest of the world is responding. Very robust programs were announced and put in, uh, were, were announced in 2023 budget. It's nearly 2024 budget, and we're being told by the end of this year now, we'll hopefully get to a place where your members and others will see what is available. It's too long. It's too slow. We have to act with greater urgency and ambition because the Americans are handing out checks right now. You, you talk about, like, investment, though. And, I mean, we hear this from the Deputy Prime Minister and the Finance Minister, Christian Freeland, that Canada ranks really high in terms of direct foreign investment. There is money, they argue, flowing into Canada 
from outside of Canada. Why, why do you think there's a, a chill on it uh, domestically? Maybe, maybe those who are here know a little bit more than those who are finding out the other end. I mean, take a look at Nordstrom, Target, Rexall. Companies have come, companies have gone. It's a difficult place. And you're seeing now the, the, the reputation that this is not a place that builds things anymore. And that's very important for our country. Look, we agree, uh, like, this is Canada's moment. You know, they're talking about seizing the moment. But that hashtag and rhetoric has to be put in place with the policies that support that. So markets look, capital looks and says, well, what are you doing here? Are you like screaming out against profits? When did profits become a bad word in a democracy that is free enterprise and celebrates capital? Those profits were made after jobs were created, after taxes were paid, after philanthropy was done, after CSR was done, innovation was done. And who are those profits for? They're for Canadians. There are Canadian pension plans, Canadian RSPs, Canadian shareholders, Canadian TFSAs. We shouldn't be creating a condition that says we're just going to create an attack on business. And by the way, from both sides, uh, this, is, this is what I'm concerned by is in a pre-sort of rid environment that we seem to be in sure. for the next 18 months. What's populist and what's great pub, uh, politics is going to make for horrible public policy. But you know what? Capital just moves. Talent doesn't come, and I don't want to be, believe me, in this chair telling you I told you so. And this is what I'm, uh, what my and my members are really trying to create is a, a, a mechanism by which we can work together to grow the pie, not just spend all our efforts on attacking business. But there are certain sectors of the economy that have done very well while Canadians have done not so well. Well, I'm not right? sure no. Canadians have not done well. I think Canadians aren't feeling the benefits of the economic. Well, cost of yeah. living is really high. You know, mortgage rates are really high. Wages all of these are things up. are happening. <laughs> but not in some sectors, for example. Like, you know, and I don't want to pick on a particular company, but like the grocery stores are the one that's most often targeted for the windfall profits that you're warning against. We saw in the pandemic, you know, early they gave a $2 an hour hero pay, as they called it, bumped to people and quickly got rid of that uh, before things were over. And, and the profits and the revenues just keep growing and growing well, and growing while the grocery bills keep growing and, and the employees are you're not in, You're in an increases. industry where you know, the margins are in the 5% range. Uh, you're in an industry where there is a lot of competition. Not only is there competition from Canadians and four or five different chains there, you've got three of the bigger multinationals here with Amazon and Costco and Walmart. So sure. you've got a lot of competition. It's possible the other issues could well be supply, demand, supply chains, that this is not about uh, profits as much as it is about the reality of, of that industry right now. So I think we have to get the facts out there. And I know that that's one of the things that you're trying to do. And I appreciate that. Yeah, look, I, I, and I appreciate that the price of food is tied to a lot of global factors that have very little to do with things like carbon pricing and all these sorts of things domestically because it is a global phenomenon. But there are still companies that are churning up big profits while reducing the size of their workforce and, and while costs are going up for Canadians. So like I, I know you're warning against the negative impact of this on the business sector and the knock-on effect for retirements and savings. But you, we are in this pre writ period and this is, this is the mood. Well, our right? GDP, and it's not just the Liberals, it, it's, it's all the parties yeah, talking about But our about GDP this. per capita has declined for six consecutive quarters here. Um, you know, you, you listen to the United States talk about uh, taking, you know, introducing corporate taxes, as the president has suggested. What a great opportunity for Canada to differentiate itself. It's hard enough to compete with the Americans as it is. Why not work with the business community to figure out how it is we can grow our economy? Because it's through that growth that we're going to be able to sustain the programs, help those who are not able to help themselves, you know, take care of our social programs, which Canadians know. I mean, they're in some cases literally on life support. Our health care system needs a lot of, 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 of reform. How are we going to do that if only thing we're going to do is move the shells around and just simply take on business. Why not collaborate? Why not cooperate? And inflation, David, and something else that's you know, the reasons, the real cause behind a lot of this is it's still sticky. Uh, yeah. And the worst thing you can do t as, a, as a finance minister today is to add to that with more spending. And so one of the reasons we're calling for no new spending is you haven't even done a good job with the ones you've already announced. Well, mo most of the spending inflation from the government sector now is provincial and municipal. This is what the analysis shows. It's less the federal stuff because they've unwound a lot of the they've things. They've given a lot to both those, uh, sure. both those governments. But spend wisely. No one is saying don't spend. No one is saying, you know, don't invest in, uh, in people. And businesses invest in people all the time, particularly in training, in skills, mm -hmm. preparing for the new jobs. Some of those, uh, some of those uh, losses that you spoke about are, are not jobs that were going to be replaced. So what you've really done is reallocated some of that capital to say, okay, how are we going to invest in the productivity of our country and in our businesses? And all of that trickles down. That's the plan. That's the hope. 
you know, the members I work for, I can certainly say, are, are, are driven by making Canada competitive, uh, by creating an environment in which Canadians can prosper as much as businesses can prosper, and there's nothing wrong with either one of those two things. What, one of the big challenges they're facing in terms of uh, meeting the climate goals of this government and, and also sustaining a robust economy is how to deal with the oil and gas sector in Canada. Your organization is pushing them to reconsider their oil and gas emissions cap. They, they've already gotten significant pushback on this at the provincial government level, Alberta and, 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 and Saskatchewan and Newfoundland and Labrador. How do they proceed on this? Oil companies are still making pretty good money. How do you proceed on this and, and, and hit your emissions targets to save the planet, as everyone says, yeah. uh, if the oil and gas sector is not forced to, to hit some sort of a target? Well, here's what ambitions. I know about emissions. Uh, much like COVID and capital, they don't respect any borders or boundaries. And so if we're serious, if we're going to have an adult conversation uh, about how to reduce emissions, we have to do it from a global perspective, not a local perspective. Canada has the capacity to help countries like Japan, uh, Korea, India, China, and others who are building up coal plants sure. uh, to off offload that onto liquefied natural gas, LNG, which you know, next year the LNG Canada project will come online and there's a permitting done for phase two, but if we could get more gas there, we could get it, get it out. Nuclear is going to be a big part of this, something the government was originally opposed to, but they had to come around because you know what's happening, David? The facts can never be ignored. They just keep coming back and now the government sees that. Same thing originally on carbon capture. Didn't want to capture it, now recognizes that we need to do it. We can do these things, but I've got to tell you, if we come at an emissions cap, if I were the Department of Finance, I would be extremely concerned. Now, we have a government that seems to have a little less worry about the fiscal framework, no more than happy to run deficit and debt, uh, is now going to go after an industry that represents about 10% of our GDP. The consequences of that on revenues will be even higher, and we're just creating a perfect storm if we're not careful. But you say we have that globally. You talked about the economic performance of uh, product, uh, GDP per capita declining. Yeah. Our emissions per capita are high you know, compared to the rest of the world. I, I mean, I know in the overall picture, it's a small percentage yeah. of the global picture, but on a per capita global basis, I mean, don't we need to take care of our own business here yeah, at home so if we're going to be credible in speaking to the rest yeah, of the, the world? The choices are very limited for people who want oil and gas, and of all of the choices that they have, Canada is the cleanest, Canada is the one most committed to the environment, Canada is the one that's most committed to the innovation, and so we can be a part of the solution. Our government should be pushing uh, the fight for Article 6. Right, the idea that maybe Canada's emissions have to go up, but the global emissions come down. So if you're serious about climate change, that should be the objective, not penalizing an industry here that's trying to help offset the increase in emissions that's taking place around the world. Okay, uh, Goldie Hyder, President and CEO of the Business Council of Canada. We'll check back with you on Budget Day. Always good to be with you, David. The Liberal government is facing multiple social challenges as it debates what to include in this month's federal budget. There's an ongoing climate crisis, there is a severe housing shortage, and health care is under significant pressure. So, how do they prioritize their spending? Armin Yalnesian is the Atkinson Fellow on the Future of Workers at the Atkinson Foundation, and she joins me now. Armin, it's always good to talk to you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So in the run-up to this budget, we've heard a lot of concerns raised about the need to invest in productivity because Canada's GDP per capita is declining compared to countries such as the United States. You don't think that's the right metric to focus on. What's the issue there? The issue is that it doesn't tell us anything about why GDP per capita is higher in the United States. And it is higher in the United States for a few reasons. First of all, it has definitely increased its oil production and it has increased its nature as a tax haven. And that's what the U.S. has in common with almost all of the uh, big countries that are you know, top the list in terms of GDP per capita, which are oil, expo oil exporters and tax havens. But the other thing that puts the United States apart from everybody else is soaring inequality. And that also can drive up GDP per capita, which is an average measure that tells you nothing about its distribution or where that money goes once you have generated it in an economy. So it's not the right metric to be, you know, it's not our lodestar metric. There's lots of different ways of focusing on how you improve the productivity of a nation. And frankly, there's a clue in the in a handful of the nations that are at the top of the heap, which are the Nordic nations that have used their money to invest in people broadly and let them do what they do best, which is generate jobs, generate wealth, generate innovations. You can't do that if you're hungry, if you're looking for a place to live or worried about losing your place. You can't do that if it costs too much to educate yourself. And that's the way they have spent their money in terms of GDP per capita. It's a great lesson for us to pay attention to. Put the capita back into GDP per capita. 
Right, you can drive up your GDP per capita by creating a bunch of billionaires, but that does nothing for middle class and working class people because they don't necessarily share in that. So you mentioned the Nordic countries. Is that where Canada should look as it's preparing for this budget on what its priorities should be? I know when we spoke at the cabinet retreat in Montreal, you advised the government to invest in the care economy, to focus on you know long-term care, care at home, uh, home care, all of these things as a way of, of allowing for economic productivity and societal growth? Where do you think they need to go? Well, I absolutely think that that is one of the core jobs of government. And it's all of government. It isn't just the federal government, but it's definitely not an area that you want to back, back off from. What's fascinating to me is just in the last few days, we've heard the federal government basically saying to the provinces, to whom they gave billions upon billions of dollars, if you don't use it for the reason we gave our federal taxpayers money to you to improve things like health care, long-term care, child care. If you don't use it for those reasons, we're going to take it back from you and we're going to take our turn in, in spending it in the places that people want it spent. So I think we're looking at a very muscular approach to, yeah, you've got the money. How are you using it? And what are you getting for it? What is your value for what you are spending? And I think that's exactly the appropriate way to, appropriate way to look forward at how are you actually boosting the entire economy for everybody as we move forward. When you, when you look at these competing demands and you overlay it with the political situation and, and the runway the government has until the next election, and then you factor in that despite the promises to make progress on housing and other things, the government has committed to commit to keeping the deficit at $40 billion or below, how much room do you reasonably expect Christian Freeland to have to, to deliver uh, on meaningful measures uh, in this budget? Yeah, that's a great question, David. And of course, just a reminder to everybody that fiscal anchors are really important, but governments are more than bean counters. And there's lots of ways to deal with both the revenue as well as the expenditure side. Don't forget, we put in $10 billion in infrastructure projects and actually levered another $10 billion from the private sector. And those projects are beginning to have returns on investment. We could recycle that source of revenue. We could also be looking at things like the people that laughed all the way to the bank during the pandemic did really, really well. Taking a look at uh, you know how both corporations and people that did really well can contribute to the people that paid the highest price for the pandemic and the pandemic reopening. So there are different ways of looking at the revenue side of it, other than just, you know, axing the tax, cutting the programs. And that's really what's on, on, on offer right now. As we go forward to this next budget, it's, it's showtime, right? Like the next budget is too late. This is the moment that the calendar says, don't just tell us, show us what you can do as a government and give us a reason to vote for you again. If you're gonna give us that reason, this is your chance to do it. Well, there is though a, um, a push to rein in spending that is time to normalize You know, the, the ledger after the big spending necessities of the pandemic. And you do have the New Democrats saying, hey, let's look at a windfall tax for some of these people you say made out all the way to the bank during the pandemic, but business groups and others pushing back a against that idea. Do you think mm -hmm. that's reasonably a path uh, Christian Freeland and, and Justin Trudeau could embark on given the dynamic in the country right now? I think if they cut spending, I mean, there's always places you can cut spending. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. There's uh, all sorts of ways of reallocating funding within the envelope. But to cut spending as a share of the economy goes exactly counter what demographic trends require, which is a growing population that is no longer in the workforce. It's retired. It needs more health care. It needs more long term care. It needs more stuff that only taxes can pay for. So if you're gonna cut taxes and cut spending, you're moving in the opposite direction to what governance now requires. It's, it is a, you know, it is totally a, a shift from the last 40 years, which has been all about uh, less government, more market. But that is not the moment we are in and won't be for about 20 years. And, you know, we have to come to grips with that. Of course, business doesn't want that to happen. Business doesn't want to be taxed. And it doesn't want governments to spend. But if we rely on the private sector to spend on the care economy in particular, what we're seeing in the United States, the United Kingdom and Europe is that we are paying more, getting less and at a, at a time when we're going to need more. Why would we go down that path? It's crazy. So just as a final point, you know, compared to where we were leading into last year's budget, there's more clarity and, and it's a better picture, not just a clearer picture. The, the country seems to have avoided the recession and hit what appears to be the soft landing that a lot of people didn't think would happen. But even though inflation has slowed down, 
uh, there's still affordability challenges because of the baked in uh, increases in those costs. Young people in particular are angry and looking mm -hmm. for help and want to see something on the affordability side. What, what can the government do in this budget uh, for the under 40, under 35, under 30 crowd in particular? A hundred percent has got to be on rental housing. And that isn't just the under 40s. It includes people that are having to leave their, uh, their house, households because mortgage costs have eclipsed it. So the rental market, and in particularly the non-market part of rental housing is absolutely vital. But they could also be doing things like, as they've been doing for the under 40 set is, uh, you know, improving childcare, improving access to dental care, vision care, pharma care, the things that you pay for out of pocket. If you can decommodify those things, you're making life more affordable. Even if you're not making more money, suddenly things are more affordable. So that's the path to go down in the next little while, I think. Armin Yelnizian, always appreciate the perspective. Thanks for joining us today.